Hello, everyone. Welcome to What's Wrong with the Podcast. Today, we're delighted to be speaking with Nan Strauss. Nan is the Managing Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Grant Making for Every Mother Counts, where she leads the organization's efforts to advance policies and programs that expand access to quality, respectful, and equitable care practices for all members of the community. Previously, as the Director of Research and Policy at Choices in Childbirth, Nan's work included research and advocacy framing midwifery and doula care as high-value models of care in alignment with the triple aim for healthcare improvement. She conducted program evaluation and development for the Healthy Woman, Healthy Futures Initiative, a program providing community-based doula support to several hundred women a year in all five boroughs of New York City. Nan's work on maternal health began at Amnesty International USA, where as the Director of Maternal Health Research and Policy, she co-authored the groundbreaking report Deadly Delivery, the Maternal Health Care Crisis in the USA in 2010. Her work framed maternal and reproductive health in the context of the right to health and included campaigning, policy, advocacy, and media efforts regarding maternal health. She has briefed members of Congress on the U.S. maternal health crisis and worked to develop and strengthen federal and state legislation. Nan, welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to have you. We were very much looking forward to this episode. So please do tell us about yourself and your background. Sure. My training is actually as a lawyer. I worked um, as an attorney on reproductive rights law before starting working on maternal health and birth justice and um, human rights related to maternal health specifically. I went to Amnesty International USA um, in 2008, so it's some time ago now, and it was right as Amnesty was starting to work on maternal health as a human right globally. And one of the large organizational priorities was to say, how can we turn the human rights lens on high resource countries, not just use the human rights lens as a tool to look at issues in low resource or developing countries, but really this is about how we look at these issues around the globe, and it's certainly relevant in high resource countries as well. And as soon as you start to look at the maternal health and maternal mortality uh, data globally amongst our high resource peers, it's very, very clear that one country falls behind all of the rest and has far worse outcomes, and that's the United States. So from there, based on that data, we started looking into what really is going on in the U.S. Um, and the reason that this is a human rights issue is because, of course, most of these deaths are preventable. And um, once we decided to look into that, I did research for two years in the United States, interviewing and speaking with literally hundreds of people around the country from all different stakeholder groups, whether it's physicians, public health experts, midwives, but also members of communities to talk to them about what their experience was like in getting maternity care. Where were the barriers? Where were the hurdles? What were they experiencing and feeling? Was there discrimination, um, et cetera? What were the options that they saw and what did they want to see? So really focusing on what people's experiences were in that care and trying to figure out what the barriers were that were um, contributing to the problem. And back in 2008, when I started this work, that's also when I met Christy Turlington Burns, who is the founder of Every Mother Counts. Um, so we've now been collaborating in different ways for 13 years. Um, we met when we both were doing our research. She was getting her, she was in the um, Masters of Public Health program at the time at Columbia and starting to work on a film called No Woman, No Cry about maternal health globally and with a chapter in the US. Um, I helped out on that film. And from that film, she took that idea and that um, her passion about this issue to create first the film, 
then a campaign to create change, and then a full-fledged nonprofit organization. And so here we are in, in 2021 still collaborating. And um, thank you for doing that and, you know, all your work. Um, so you did mention uh, the, you know, I guess it's the year of 2020 is so disappointing to hear um, such a, a fact, but uh, the status of the United States and how it's so behind. And let's talk some stats and facts, I guess. Like, what are we talking about here and why? Why are we seeing that in the United States? Yeah, well, to start out um, with the stats and facts, the U.S. spends the most per capita on maternity care of any country in the world, and yet we fare the worst of any high-resource country, 55th in the nation in terms of maternal deaths, and the story goes far beyond maternal deaths, but maternal deaths are a useful metric for measuring where and how the system is failing. Right now, we're one of only two countries in the world where maternal mortality rates are consistently going wow. up rather than one of just two. And maternal mortality rates are now twice what they were a couple of decades ago. So people now are more likely to die as a consequence of pregnancy and childbirth than our mothers were a generation ago. And I say that not to make people scared in pregnancy and childbirth. Of course, those deaths are incredibly, incredibly rare. And almost everyone will come through pregnancy and birth with flying colors. But, but it does signal these really significant systems failures that are exposing people to risk where it just shouldn't be an issue and isn't an issue, in fact, in other um, high-resource countries. And what we know is that even here in the, in the setting that we're in, experts consider 60% of those deaths to be preventable. Um, at the same time, it's not just deaths, severe complications have also risen rapidly have been skyrocketing, and likewise, 50% of those are considered preventable. And perhaps what's most disturbing is that um, those risks are not shared equally. The disparities in maternal health outcomes are one of the most extreme health disparities in any area of public health. And we know that Black women and Indigenous women in particular face two to three times the risk of death from pregnancy or childbirth complications as do their white counterparts. Also, this is not an issue around poverty. It's not an issue around people getting care through Medicaid. We see those cross-cutting racial and ethnic differences and disparities at all income levels, at all education levels, um, wow. for people of all health statuses, so people who are healthy, people who have high-risk complications. We see it in um, individual hospitals. So at every, every way you can stratify the data, you see that those racial disparities persist. And that is one of the things that is most important um, to highlight, to elevate, and to address from the get-go. To be clear, white women in this country also do very poorly. So if you compare the outcomes of just white women in the US to the whole population, including immigrants, minority populations, people of color in European countries, white women here still do worse than 20 to 30 other countries, entire populations. So to be clear, there's an issue for everyone. It's a systems issue. And also, every mother counts, and folks who are taking either a human rights perspective or a birth justice perspective on this issue make a real priority of saying we really need to tackle the issues that are affecting the populations that are facing the worst outcomes. We need to prioritize those and start to tackle those first. And instead of having a system where you want good effects to trickle down, 
we want those good effects to trickle yeah. up. Yeah. So what are those systemic failures? Why are we seeing this, you know, regardless of what race you are or regardless of where you are in the United States and how are we failing as a country in such like extreme way? So when you look at this from a human rights perspective, um, what you see are systems failures across the board. So you see people not having good access to care. You see care not being available and having shortages of care providers in some areas. You see care being offered in a way where it's really not culturally acceptable. Hmm. And you also see quality issues. So at Every Mother Counts, we talk about our work as working to achieve quality, respectful, and equitable care for all. And so what that means um, on the ground is we're seeing people who don't have access either because they they can't afford the care that they need, they don't have the transportation to get to the care that they need. Mm -hmm. uh, there are care shortages both in urban and rural parts of the country that are affecting outcomes. But I think even more than those issues, what stands out in a very high resource setting like the US is the gap between the evidence-based practices that we know result in good outcomes for large numbers of people and the options that are actually available and the practices that are in place. Um, and then also we see real issues around a lack of respectful treatment. Hmm. And one of the focuses that we have organizationally at Every Mother Counts that also reflects this human rights framework is saying, you know, we need to find the solutions in the communities that are experiencing the problems. What do people really identify as the problems? And what you hear over and over and over again in this area is you hear people coming out of their care saying they weren't listened to, they didn't have options, they didn't have agency to make the decisions that they wanted to make. And while that may be an issue in our healthcare system overall, it plays an even bigger part around care related to pregnancy and childbirth because this is not going in for knee surgery. This yeah. is a major life event. First of all, most people are starting out healthy. And even if they have some kind of chronic condition like high blood pressure or diabetes, it's not something that is putting them in a life-threatening situation on a daily basis. They're going in to experience a normal process of life, giving birth. And as such, and because it really should be uh, viewed as something that starts out healthy and complications would be, of course, addressed as they developed, but there are an unusual number of opportunities in this area of healthcare to really focus on preventive measures, educate yeah. people about how to stay healthy, have healthy pregnancies, and make healthy decisions. And it's even more important, I think, than in other areas to involve and engage people in care decisions. And what you see is this isn't just... Um, it's not, I think sometimes people hear about issues of respectful care, listening to people and think, well, that's nice, but don't we really just need to look at the medical procedures? And what's been fascinating to learn through the research is how closely intertwined these issues are. Mm -hmm. Because what you hear, you hear in, in anecdotes and you hear in research, um, for instance, we were part of fielding a very large study in the U.S. called the Giving Voice to Mothers survey. So in, in data collected through that survey, as well as high profile news stories, like ex the experience of Serena Williams, for instance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the experience of a woman named Shalon Irving, who was a CDC epidemiologist. Um, you, you hear 
people reaching out to their care providers saying something is not right. And what you hear them say after that is no one listened to them. They had to push and push and push. They call their provider, they go in, they keep saying something is not right. I don't feel well. And over and over again, and this is even more common for women of color, nothing's done. Their concerns are ignored, their concerns are belittled, and they're not taken seriously. And what you learn then from the data from maternal mortality review committees um, is that in fact, provider factors are very common contributors to when a complication progresses and escalates to something that is life-threatening and then potentially does cause the death of the person. And of those provider factors, one of the most common is failing to act in a timely manner. So there's a real continuum from someone who is not listened to and treated disrespectfully and we say, okay, well, but isn't that just the healthcare system? No, it's really not acceptable yeah. because there's a direct through line to people who then become very, very sick, whether it's a severe complication um, that potentially has, has that is life-threatening, but also has lifelong impacts, like can lead to a hysterectomy, can lead to months and months and months of recuperation and disability, but then also can lead to death. It is so shocking. I mean, yes, you touched upon already, like maybe this is like something to look at with our like entire healthcare system and sort of like how um, the more we try to like advance healthcare, the more standardization is happening and the more standardization happening, the more I think we're sort of like distancing ourselves that in the end we're humans and each and every one of us are unique. Our experiences are unique. And in this scenario, first of all, it's such a human experience, right? Like it's not, you know, just like one incident that happens and you go to the doctor and you get a prescription and you leave. It's like nine plus something months. And then there's like pre and post uh, like recovery or like preparation and education for it that is required. And it's such a, a such an area where if not at anything else, like in this area, you need to have a holistic attention because it's not just like anything physical. Like, as you said, it's not a knee surgery. There's huge psychological and mental aspect of this like entire process too. Like even if we uh, do not see like something resulting in death, we still might see a lot of mental and psychological uh, aspect of it taking place, such as depression, right? And that's just like maybe one version. And that also, you know, leads to so many more, I guess, like um, detrimental and long-term consequences of even how you raise a child. You know, it's just like goes on and on and on. And then we can, we're talking about future because children are the future. So um, in that sense, it is um, the, when people are reaching out, addressing a concern or a problem and the way they're not treated as human at the moment, is it because it is not medical so that means it's not billable or i guess like it's like motive behind as a care provider not providing care this really is a systems problem and yeah. as someone who has worked closely with professional associations with individual healthcare providers people who are so committed to um, making improvements in this area. Um, I have yet to meet a healthcare provider who really doesn't care about the people they're taking care of. But what that raises is this need to look at the problem from a systems perspective yeah. and say, how do we listen to what the patients, the community members are telling us, listen to those experiences, and translate them into systems yeah. solutions. Because we need to create a system that supports healthcare providers in providing the best care 
possible. And we know right now, if we have ever turned on a television or opened a newspaper, that the healthcare system overall is facing a number of challenges and problems. Yeah. In this area, one of those problems is that right now, four out of five dollars spent on maternity care goes to the, what's called the intrapartum period, the period right around labor and birth where it's the hospital care, basically. Mm. And that leaves one fifth, 20% of the funding to cover those nine months of pregnancy and uh, postpartum months, what some people refer to as the fourth trimester. Yeah. It really is a continuation physically and mentally of the process of giving birth. And now people are really recognizing that that fourth trimester, the postpartum period, really carries through the full year following childbirth, um, which is leading to an increase in advocacy around making sure that there's healthcare coverage for that full year following childbirth and a recognition that there may be complications that need to be addressed remaining yeah. through that process. And certainly, as you mentioned, mental health and um, perinatal mood disorders whether that's depression, anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, which sometimes results from trauma around childbirth, um, particularly when there's a real, um, a really life-threatening or serious complication that happens, yeah. either for the person giving birth or for the for the baby, but that that needs to be taken very seriously and really incorporated into giving care. So. I think it's a combination, you know, physicians aren't supported in, by the system in having a lot of those referral resources. They're often struggling with a, um, a system of payers, um, private insurers and Medicaid yeah. that don't necessarily reimburse things well. And so one of the ways that we focus on making change is both by is by taking really a multifaceted approach and that means one of the clinical solutions that's been very successful and and has received a lot of attention is the development and funding of safety protocols and guidelines um, that are called safety bundles mm -hmm. bundles of information that can then be turned into real actionable protocols to address leading complications of uh, pregnancy and birth that can result in negative outcomes. So that's been sort of a main mm. clinical approach. On the other hand, and it, it has been really important and, and has represented tremendous effort by very, very dedicated, incredible healthcare providers physicians, midwives, nurses, public health folks all coming together. At the same time, I can't help but feel like it's great that we're getting to where we should have been 10, 15 years ago, where, for instance, the UK has been for a good 15, maybe more yeah. years. Yeah. So it's, it's critical and it's not the end of the exactly. story. So we also need to think how else can we support physicians? Well, and midwives as well are a, are a key solution. Midwives around the world are the main um, provider of maternity care, mm -hmm. including in Europe, um, for uncomplicated births. And they also work in, on teams to provide team-based care for people who do have complications and might need to see a specialist that that midwife is still there as part of the team, making sure that the um, preventive measures and the more holistic perspective is taken care of to complement the care of the specialist. So midwives as well, but to make sure that there are supports for those medical providers and that those are reimbursed by insurance. Hmm. 
one of those big solutions um, that we look at a lot, in addition to the midwifery model and integrating that, um, for whether it's for family physicians, obstetricians, or midwives themselves, another issue is what kind of support services do people need, would they benefit from, and how are they going to get reimbursed? Because we really need to see a change in the payment model yeah. to make those solutions um, durable. Yeah. I, honestly, I think like uh, as you're speaking, so much of it is like, which is also why your work is so important, ties into a lot of awareness and education, not only on this like problem, but like potential ways of addressing the problem. Because like when I didn't even, I mean, maybe this is my ignorance, but I consider myself an educated and exposed person, but I didn't even understand really the role of a midwife or doula uh, until I got pregnant. And then I think my doula was the person who supported me the most throughout the entire process because so much of it, even for uh, a, a, a pregnant woman, is just, you just have a lot of questions. Your body is changing constantly. Uh, and it's nerve wracking sometimes. And uh, sometimes you actually do have a problem. And who do you talk to? And like, who do you talk text in the middle of the night if you have a question? Like no doctor is going to respond to you uh, because that is also probably not covered by insurance um, or they have a life. But your doula is there always and, so, and doesn't care if your questions are silly or actually very legitimate. So it's, I, but I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought maybe it was like an option, like an alternate instead of, you know, going to the hospital. Like, but I didn't even understand the importance. I mean, pregnancy and like, you know, maternity, being a mom, it's all, you, you learn about it once you go through it. It's a very, you can explain it all the time, but it's really hard to really understand. So when it actually happens to you, it doesn't matter how educated you are, you really need to almost like revisit everything that you've learned or thought you knew in the past. So you need that support system as that's happening. And, um, but I think there is already like a huge plus, like if you know, going into it, oh, I was told that I'm going to need this person. And, you know, if my care provider is not providing that, I'm going to change that, or I'm going to ask about it or demand about it, or I'm going to, you know, uh, talk to this organization and see how, how I might get help. So even if we do have some awareness on how we might go about it, um, that's a huge, huge starting point. Um, because, I mean, when it, regardless of the industry or the field we're talking about, we like education, awareness, collaboration are always like themes that we're landing on in solutions, right? Mm -hmm. Like we need diverse collaborations, multidisciplinary collaborations. 99% of the time for solutions, as well as, you know, a uh, good education and awareness on the user side too, as the person, person who is going through it so that, yeah, I asked my caregiver, um, they didn't address it, but I'm going to continue to demand it because I was told or that I should be doing it or I can do it. You know, some people, and this is so right, as you said, it's the human rights issue. Um, we don't even know if it's our right. Um, it's not even, you know, acknowledged or known or talked about much that, you know, pregnancy itself is considered a temporary disability. Um, so we have all these, um, you know, th right that, rights that we have to sort of exercise throughout our own pregnancy um, and childbirth, uh, but we sort of, I feel like, need to go in equipped and ready to ready to battle almost because what I'm like hearing about this a lot of it being systemic um yes like which is why it's so crucial to have organization organizations like yourselves to push for change in in the system but so much effort always also relies on bottom-up push from everyone um and the more demand that comes from everyone too, that forces the system because policy, unfortunately, usually always, maybe not even, okay, not always, but usually lags. Um, so that push is always required and the push, uh, it's not enough for it to just come from like organizations or institutions, but people themselves, like seeing that this is their right and there's nothing to be shameful or, um, 
you know, worried about uh, reaching out for help, which is also, you know, I guess a, a common issue of, I guess, pregnant women and moms in general, like we don't ask for help too. So like all these like mindset shifts that are required so much. And uh, in like, in addition to all like the policy work, how do you see uh, this like bottom up uh, push can take place more and how can we sort of, I guess, onboard pregnant women and uh, prospective moms to really like rise up for themselves and their own well-being. Sorry, that was so, a very loaded question, but I had like a no, chain of like thought going through. It's great and I have like 20 thoughts and I'm sure, you know, if I'm lucky, three of them will come out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the rest of them I'll, I'll keep trying to do that. So, I mean, that really gets at the way that Every Mother Counts was founded and, and the way that we work because you have to come at these issues from both directions. So yeah. what we do in our work, we have three strands of work and they're all interrelated and it's sort of all answering the, the question that you yeah. have. And one is as an organization that started, that grew out of this film, No Woman, No Cry, it has always been incredibly important to us to raise awareness about the issues and not just about the problems but also about the solutions and the steps that people can take to make sure that they do have a good outcome and a good experience of care and that's not to put the burden on them or to say it's their fault if they don't yeah. but it's to say you know what tools and information can we share um, and make accessible and make interesting and enjoyable yeah. to watch. And how can people become educated um, and translate that into really actionable steps for themselves? If we can help in that process, that's one of the things that's really in our organizational DNA. Yeah. At the same time, one of the next steps to the natural progression for if you're creating if you're raising awareness and creating um, an engaged community, then the next thing is those people want to do something, whether it's making decisions in their own care, asking questions, seeing what their options are, learning more, and then also potentially engaging in a way of either supporting organizations that are doing good work or supporting policy change. And that yeah. sort of leads into, you know, one of the other areas of our work, which is really mobilizing community members to take action for change, whether it's legislative change or sharing information further, um, et cetera. And then the other area of our work at Every Mother Counts is that we're able to give grants to strong community-based organizations that are putting in place evidence-based solutions in the communities that are most affected by um, the problems in the system. So we work really closely. We partner hand in hand with community-based organizations around the country with amazing strong leaders who are also engaging in this systems change work as they are also providing care and support for members of their own communities. And then, you know, coming back around to that policy and advocacy piece, we also use, um, we feel like we can deploy our expertise, our experience, and the relationships that we've built in communities to do some kind of translating, translating the data and this transmitting the stories of yeah. community members to decision makers and policy makers because it, that, there is that tension between we want to share tools and information with individuals and also, for example, I've been at a number of public health conferences where I hear people saying like, well, you know, these options are out there and women just aren't taking advantage of them. And I, so I, I had 
babies before working in this field. My babies are big. Um, <laughs> and, um, so I came in as a knowledgeable, educated consumer, but not with the interpersonal network that I certainly have now. And yeah. I will tell you, in New York City, the context is that there's a very um, robust set of options for people who have very complicated pregnancies. And if you have a really severe complication, you are in the right place to get mm. like super top notch, high tech care. And if you have a either a pregnancy where if you have a pregnancy, if you want to seek care from a midwife, it's a lot harder. It's a financial situation here where it's very hard for midwives to make private practice work. There are a lot of amazing midwives working in um, New York City hospitals, but in an ironic twist, um, many of those practices only see patients who are covered by Medicaid. And you literally cannot pay to see those practices with private insurance, and that's an amazing problem to have. But as a person who was seeking a midwife, I, you know, I made all the calls and I was like, well, this person moved out of the city and this person isn't taking new patients and this person is full for that month. Even that. So just to say that you, people can't always do it. Even, yeah. you know, and that is the person who you most expect to be able to do it. And then you think about, well, what are the options for people who have limited transportation? who have limited options because their job isn't providing them time off to go to doctor's appointments, who perhaps speak a different language and want to see a provider in their own language or want to see yeah. someone who understands their culture. It's the limitations are so extreme. So it's just to say, yeah, I think we need to come at it from all the different. Yeah. And sort of like your role there is also being the bridge, right? Because right the policy is there or let's say something is even available under your uh health insurance but the health insurance policies are designed to be complicated in a way that you don't even understand what you're reading you don't even understand if you're covered not covered whatever that's go like going on there um so you need that like person who bridges the gap and like connects the dots for you like if there is and imagine you know you're a pregnant woman, maybe, you know, going through this by yourself, like no support system, you have multiple jobs, no, like, uh, you know, resources. How do you just, how can you just say, you know, the stuff is out there for anyone who takes like that? And so that's one of the reasons that we really focus, uh, the organizations that we partner with are really rooted in their communities, the yeah. community that, most need the, the solutions, that need the solutions most urgently. So, for example, here in New York City, there's an organization called Ancient Song Doula Services that we've worked with for many, many years. And, you know, doula support, when you're talking about community-based doula support, isn't exactly the same as in a private pay context. It really mm -hmm. goes above and beyond. You know, there are people who for one thing, have multiple visits during pregnancy, multiple postpartum visits, are there constantly, you know, for phone and tech support, as you were mentioning before. And part of what they do is exactly the same. It's providing education and information. Part of it also goes beyond and is providing a number of referral referrals as needed. You know, so if someone does need their basic needs met, or needs information um, about WIC or lactation support. Yeah. There are, you know, referrals and connections that those organizations can make. And there's information that they can provide about nutrition and finding food, healthy food in that community. Um, yeah. And providing that information in a way that's culturally appropriate, that's really going to help people problem solve, not just have them be like, yeah, that's not relevant to me you know, it's <laughs> exactly. relevant because it's people who are in those communities. Um, and then it's also 
it makes a lot more sense when you see someone who you can identify with. It's not like someone saying, well, this exactly. is the answer for you. It's much more meaningful and easier for people to hear and, and it makes sense. And that kind of trusting relationship is really what's at the core of so many of these solutions. It's at the core of the midwifery model. It's at the yeah. core of doula support. It's people who really understand how to listen non-judgmentally, build trust, and over time help people open up and do the kind of communicating that can really help address their needs in a way that is individualized and reflects um, good evidence-based solutions. Such such an important um, approach. And I frankly, I think the only way um, any solution is sustainable, you know, working uh, with community-based organizations and just having uh, partners that are hyper-local. And I think this is a, this should be an analogy for any other industry or organization or institution that is trying to address uh, issues among uh, various communities because uh, even if you have all the funding, how would you even know how to use it if you're not in touch with the communities themselves, right? So it's such an important model to follow and mimic in really regardless of what field you're in. And, you know, as we were talking about this like entire thing, I was also, you know, thinking about, I guess, just the importance. And I guess this goes out to us, like all moms, um, just the importance about being open and honest about all the hard things that we go through being pregnant or even like early uh, parts of, you know, um, uh, postpartum because I remember now like looking back after birth like going through you know like my daughter was colicky I didn't even know what colic meant until like the first day we ended up in an emergency room because she was crying for six hours and then they printed a sheet about like colic to me and I left the hospital and I'm like no no one talks about this why isn't anybody talking about this and there's so many of these like other things that the society sort of pushes us to, you know, oh, like all, all women get pregnant. This is a natural thing. You go to your work, be professional. It's not a big deal. And there's so much pressure on all women to just be perfect and okay and manlike or whatever that is, um, that we don't speak up about all the hard things that we have to go through or we don't reach out for help. Um, or we think, you know, oh, like other moms maybe figured out, like I shouldn't be reaching out for help. Like, no, I think all of us are going through like a shit storm really like throughout, you know, the first like part of like, like and the fourth trimester too, as you say, and we need such like a support system uh, throughout that entire time. Uh, I feel like, you know, um, some of my friends who had children around the same time that I did, like I would text them in the middle of the night about weirdest things, you know, it was so, and I realized the importance about just having a few people that you can talk to outside of your own household that would sort of keep you mentally sane about what's going on. Right. Um, and now with, I guess, like social media and internet, like, yes, there is technically more like access, but it's so important for us to just be like frank and despite what the society uh, or know-it-alls or whatever think about uh, us or uh, you know expect us to be um just such an importance about the openness of this entire situation everything that you go through and whether that is difficulty during the pregnancy with your care provider or something in postpartum um so that that adds to the collective i guess awareness and education and even like self expectations of yourself and because what you said in terms of all the psychological and mental aspect of things, so much of it, we also do it to ourselves for, because of our own expectations of ourselves, right? So um, I guess this also is a good um, conversation to like remind us all that like it's okay to be open about everything throughout what's going on. It's really true. And it's because, because there's nothing that can prepare a person for how challenging it is. And that's why in many other countries, they do have people 
doing home visits. They have people yeah. who come to the house in the days following childbirth. Mid a midwife will come check out a mom and a baby. He, as opposed to here, where new parents have to get themselves together, collect the baby, go out in what can be very inclement weather, face a public transportation system that works in varying degrees depending on where you live, <laughs> and you know, slap everybody to the doctor's office. Other countries don't make people do that. They have people come to the home. In addition, you know, there are people who come and just check in, make sure that nursing is going okay, provide that kind of household help, just check in and make sure that things are okay. Yeah. And then if medical care is needed, support the person in, in getting access to that. One of the really exciting projects that Every Mother Counts has been working on in this last year that's been innovations that has grown out of COVID-19 and the pandemic, but really meets a need that preceded and will continue on long beyond the pandemic um, has been that we've been partnering with um, Ancient Song Jewelers Services here in New York City, Village Birth International, which is another New York and New Jersey community-based organization, and an organization called Jacaranda Health that works both in Kenya and North Carolina. And the, the four organizations have come together to build on a text support platform that Jacaranda mm -hmm. developed. Um, and we've sort of built it out in a different way. And our project is called Just Birth Space and you can find it online and on Facebook. And the um, idea was it really grew out of the immediate needs during the pandemic to support people virtually during this time of added isolation, added uncertainty, and just the, the you know, the fact that it's already pregnancy and the postpartum yeah. period are already so stressful and already a time where people are facing a lot of um, need for mental health and other kinds of support, but of course now more than ever. Um, and what this um, program has done is created a, a text support line where anybody can text in or Facebook messenger in questions about pregnancy, um, baby feeding, mental health, is this normal? What do I do now? Where do I get, um, I can't afford diapers. Is there anywhere I can go? Um, whatever those questions are, are hospitals letting doulas join at birth, you know, attend in person? Um, whatever those questions are, whether they're COVID specific, basic needs, or questions that doulas would always be answering, childbirth educators would always be answering. So there's an immediate um, response and back and forth. So there's the tech support. And then there also is um, the opportunity to join virtual support groups and classes. So it's both trying to tackle some of that isolation and um, really move into a new space, the virtual space, to just provide the kind of support that we know can be so beneficial and really yeah. a pipeline for so many families. Um, and hope that that will continue to be valuable for a long, for a long time to come. So it's called Just Birth Space. Amazing. We'll definitely provide links on that in episode description, but such a good example also like how um, a crisis can turn into an opportunity of innovation and addressing something and in such an accessible way where it will definitely sustain. Um, so, so great to hear that. Um, I guess like before we wrap up, uh, I would love to ask your advice to any progress maker, boundary pusher, disruptor, whatever we want to call those uh, great people that are trying to make some change in this world. Uh, obviously, it's a hard job. So uh, what would be your advice to them? 
I love that question. <laughs> I would say two things. One is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There already are really strong evidence-based solutions that clearly support good practices. That includes providing community-based doula support, doula support overall for all people and making sure that that's sustainable, making sure that it's covered by healthcare insurance and Medicaid. Another really strong evidence-based solution is the midwifery model of care, making sure that that's more widely available to people and that people are aware that that can be um, a good choice and option. And overall, what I would say my strongest piece of advice is, is to look in the community um, for solutions that are already there, that are already working. Lift up those solutions, elevate those solutions, and really turn to community-based leaders. Recognize the wisdom that exists, the work that has already been being done for years and decades and eons, um, and find those places that the solutions are working, that there are successes, and, and lift those up. Because those are the solutions that are really reflecting the voices of people on the ground and um, listening to and trusting people to identify what their needs are and how they can best be met. Um, I, I love that advice so much uh, of it like also applies to any field you're in really. Um, and just, uh, you know, principles, I guess, of human centered design. So thank you so much, Nan. This was such a pleasure. Um, definitely very eye opening. Uh, even if you think, you know, uh, some of the issues going on, this was such a, a bigger understanding and provided such a bigger understanding of, uh, what's actually happening and how we can also start addressing it even with small steps. So thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to speak with you and a pleasure to share the information. Any other news about Every Mother Counts you want to share or um, if, you, if there's anything coming up uh, in the near future, we can also mention, provide links, give a shout out. I think, you know, the Just Birth Space project would be great to um, highlight and I hope everyone can check that out. Um, and we always have an amazing selection of short films on our website and I think those likewise would be great resources for people to check out on the website. A thousand percent agree. Thank you so much, Nan. It was lovely. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Yeah, it was really great.